I'm very, very happy to be here. I have not been here for 35 years, and God called me to Korea and Taiwan 35 years ago as a missionary. So to be able to come back is um, a fulfillment of that calling by God. Now that my children are raised and they're they're grown and they've finished college and they're in seminary now, um, it is an incredible pleasure for me to be able to come back to the place that God first called me to and I still have the deepest passionate love for. So I'm, I'm very thankful to be here tonight. Um, I'm also happy to share with you uh, uh, somebody that I have grown to love, <laughs> even though it's a, a brother from many hundreds years ago, but uh, Johannes Ecolampadius. He uh, lived uh, from 1482 to 1531, right in the middle of the Reformation. He was alive at the same time as Martin Luther and uh, Ulrich Zwingli. They were his friends, his compatriots, his peers. And he worked alongside of them in many projects. Uh, he only lived uh, to be 49 years old. He, di- he died just a few weeks after Zwingli, actually. Uh, when he was 46, he got married for the first time, so some encouragement. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. He um, he was born to a, a family in Germany, and uh, his parents had other children that they all died. He was the only child that ever lived, uh, so he was an only son, first son, only son, only child. Uh, so they put a lot of uh, attention on him. He was born in Weinsberg, Germany. And then uh, his father thought that he would prepare him for being a businessman, a tradesman. But then he saw how intelligent his son was. So he decided he would have to prepare him for university. At that time, similar to sometimes schools today, you would have to enter either a school where you would prepare for just uh, for business work or you prepare for university. And you had to decide early. I know here you have to decide in usually maybe junior high. There they had to decide even in elementary school. Is he going to go to trade school and learn how to make shoes or how to... Um, make uh, carpentry things, or is he going to university? Um, So as a young child, it was obvious he was very intelligent, and so his father and mother put him in a school, what was called a Latin school, to prepare him for university education. Latin school at that time was a very typical medieval school. They started classes at 5 o'clock in the morning, and the first class was Latin so you had to be awake. Um, That school that he went to was a very unusual school because the teacher had been trained in Heidelberg University. Heidelberg University had many humanists at that time who were fighting um, early Reformation um, causes. They were they were for the Reformation, but at that, that time they were beginning to criticize the Catholic Church, criticize the immorality, um, the the false doctrines, some of the inconsistencies, and this was particularly true in Heidelberg, where there were some very famous early humanists. One of them was named Jacob Jacob uh, Wimfailing. And so his teacher, or his Latin school, had studied at Heidelberg and so brought these ideas back. So again, for you who are training young people, you have no idea what God will do. Here was just uh, an elementary school teacher who had learned at university, and yet this student then changed all of, of history and 
How would he know at that time that his young pupil would do that? And even now is affecting us and teaching us hundreds of years later through that teacher. So be encouraged. And Agricola was also one of the famous uh, humanists that was there at the time teaching. Um, I have a picture. Let's see. So first he was in elementary school um, and Latin school. Then he went to Heidelberg University, and we will discuss this in a minute, but I wanted to show you the picture of the elementary school. So this would be a typical elementary school uh, where the children are sitting on benches and doing their work individually, and there might be a, a sort of tutor to help them. And also you can see the, the paddle, the discipline <laughs> for that the, the teacher has if they don't do their, their lesson right up front that he's reciting. So this is a, a picture that was done at that time of the type of elementary school that they would uh, be involved with. Um, in October 20th in 1499, Ecolampadius was admitted to Heidelberg University at the age of 17. Studies here at the university included Aristotelian logic, natural philosophy from Aristotle's physica, um, music, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, private lectures on topics such as Euclidean mathematics, attendance at disputations where he had to participate a certain number of times, attendance at church services, and he had to uh, maintain a bachelor's examination after that as well in order to graduate from college. From 1498 to 1501, when he was in attendance at Heidelberg University, Wim Failing, whom I've already mentioned as a very active and famous humanist at that time, was also lecturing. And he lectured um, with great passion about uh, moral reformation in the church and in the society at that time. Um, he lectured mostly from on Jerome and uh, Jerome's writings. You remember, Jerome was the one who had uh, done the major translation of the Bible into Latin, which was used for most of the Middle Ages. Um, not only did uh, God grant that this professor Wim Failing um, could plant the seeds of the Reformation in the hearts of his students, but then those students brought fruit for the Reformation through all of Europe, through that teacher. Um, in 1501, uh, Ecolampadius did receive his Bachelor of Arts degree from Heidelberg after undergoing nine examinations, public and private. And in October 1503, he got his master's degree. Um, and that was very difficult at that time because the school for a little over a year was in exile. They could not meet on the campus. Why? Because the Black Death, the plague, had attacked the city. And so they could not meet in the, the city, in the schoolroom. So everybody had to go out to the countryside and do their studies there. So for one of the two years, they were out at, away from the school in different towns in the country doing their studies. Um, then um, in 1501 uh, to 1502, oh, that's when the, he was um, in exile at university, um, after he got his master's uh, degree, then his father wanted him to go to become a lawyer. And this would be like Luther. You know, Luther was also studying to be a lawyer, and also Capito, and also Calvin, and also um, Wimfailing. They had all gone to law school before they became theologians. But Eklampati's father wanted him, now that he finished university and his master's, to go to law school. 
and one of the best law schools was in Bologna, Italy. So he was going to send him there. And they took all of the family funds um, and sent with him to a, a financial broker who would then take care of the money for his room, his board, his uh, tuition, his books, and all of the needs uh, while he would be a, a law school, a school student. Um, however, that man that they entrusted the monies to to take care of their son took the money and ran away with it so that the son now had no money for school. All of the family funds were gone. And this was a great tragedy to the family. Um, and what they saw as just a horrible disaster was really God's plan to bless the world because Ecolampadius had to return to Germany and there he began studying for theology, not law. So God trained and cha trained this man by changing what was a disaster into a great blessing for the world and for us even today. Um, the... Let's see. Uh, the, as a theological student, he was expected for the first five years to just listen to lectures for five years. Then for two years, he could give a brief exposition one year in the Old Testament and the next year in the New Testament. And then after that, um, he would be allowed to uh, study dogmatics independently, that's systematic theology, for another year, and would not have to uh, be a teacher's assistant, would not have to do any teaching in the classroom. In his ninth year, uh, then he would be able to write an exam on the uh, what was Peter Lombard's sentences that was very common as um, a study tool and uh, a subject for the theological students at that time. Um, then he was allowed to teach for two years, um, and then he had two years of study in the patristics, that is, the fathers of the church, the, the ancient fathers, such as Origen and Ambrose and uh, Chrysostom and Augustine. Um, so it would take about uh, 12 years to do uh, a theological degree at that time. Um, the professors would be uh, usually about three, one for Gospels, one for Epistles, um, one for the usually the law in the Old Testament, or maybe if there was a fourth professor, he would do writings or prophets as well. Um, so the program ran 12 years, and then they would get their doctorate in theology. And many scholars, after they received their doctorate, taught at a university or were a, took a position as a high uh, uh, cathedral preacher. And maybe a couple months or a couple years later, they died because they, it was so old by then, right? And um, people were not living very long at, it took that long to do their studying. Um, however, Luther received his doctorate in five and a half years. So he was, learned it very quickly. Uh, Ecolampadius got his doctorate in three years. Um, so now the next uh, thing after you graduate, you get your doctorate, is uh, a job. You, you have to do something, right? So he went back to his parents' home in Weinsberg, Germany, and he began teaching and preaching there. This was a very special gift from God at that time because um, young men would buy uh, positions and, in a church. So you didn't get a, uh, called to a pastor. You bought the job of being a pastor. I think sometimes some elders buy their jobs now, but uh, anyway, <laughs> that's not what is in the Bible. But um, he, so some of these pastors bought their positions, but they couldn't preach, and they'd never been to seminary. Right? They just had money. They didn't really have Jesus in their hearts. They didn't know the gospel. They didn't know the Bible. No training. So they would um, have the job, but they wouldn't do the job. They would pay somebody else to do the job. And they would just take the money. 
because everybody in the neighborhood of the church had to give their money to the church. And so the pastor would take all the money. So it was an easy way to get money. Just be a pastor and use some of the money to pay somebody else to preach. Right? That's what they did. Um, And sometimes these pastors were really little boys. Why? Because the father says, I want my son to have a good job, to have money all of his life. I've got a lot of money. I will buy him a pastorate, and he will have all of the money from that church all of his life, and he will be okay. He won't have to worry about income and about jobs and, and security. He will always have money. So they bought them for their children. It was a really terrible time. Yeah. So then what God did in, in using that, though, he, he changed it so then the new Reformed preachers who were, had the humanist perspective now came and they said, I'll preach. You know, so you had all these places where there's no preachers because they're not trained, and you had humanist, reformed preachers coming and preaching the word of God, the true word of God, in all of these sort of empty pulpits now. It was wonderful how God used that and worked that, right? Because if the church had to hire them, they wouldn't hire the reformed people, you know? Um, because they're not important enough, or they don't have the right theology yet, or you know, they wouldn't have hired them. But because the way things were in the society, God used that. So it was a great blessing in many ways because of that. Echol and Patius, um, if we go back, um, you see it, he was at the University of Bologna and then Heidelberg and... Um, then after that, the University of Basel, which we'll talk to in a minute, too. But for jobs, um, oh, yeah, this. Um, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, one of the things that made a church important was how, many, um, how much money it got, right? So you get money from the people in the area, but you can also get money from people who travel to visit your church. So if a really big, beautiful church, then people come and you, they'll give you money. Or how, why would they come to your church? Because you have a little piece of the bone of uh, the Apostle John. So if you come to our church, we have a little piece of the bone of the Apostle John, and then you can get points in heaven for looking at that bone, uh, or maybe a hair, or maybe one of his teeth, or, it, you know, they had all kinds, of, part of his finger, you know, from some saint. So, and then they put them in, in what's called a reliquary. They still sell these today. They still do this today. So this is a modern uh, advertisement for um, a reliquary. And that's, it's probably about this big. And you open the door, and they and you put inside the finger, the tooth, the piece of hair, whatever, something, you know. And then the people come and they look at it, and they, you know, and they get points in heaven. Yeah, not not in the Bible, but you know. Um, so that was another way they had of making a, a church big and great and and rich. So the, the more of these that you could get, the more people would want to come because, well, if I go to that church, I can get 10 points, you know, because they've got 10 things. If I go to that church, they only have one thing. I only get one point. So if we're going to go on a trip, we're going to go on a family trip, let's go to the church with 10 things, and then we'll, while we're there, we'll stay in the ho- hotels nearby, and we spend money, and the whole town gets richer because they have all of these um, relics from some place, you know, supposedly, okay? So this is what's happening at the time of the Reformation. All these different things are going on. These are relics. Uh, These are not relics, sorry. These are badges. From when, When you go visit a church, then you get a little badge. You know, it's like going to the Olympics, and you get a little badge, and it says, 2012, 2013, you know, and you say, wow, look at, I got this one and this one and this one. Or you go someplace and um, you see the Eiffel Tower and you get a little Eiffel Tower and you go, look, 
I was at the Eiffel Tower. Well, these are from churches where there were relics and people would go, and then they would get a little badge and say, oh, I was at that church, see? Good, right? And so I get more points. The same thing happened in, in the Bible. You know, in um, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, and they had the silversmiths had a little riot because people were not buying the little statues of Artemis and taking back. Because they would go, they would all come. I mean, it was one of the um, uh, wonders of the ancient world was the Temple of Artemis in Ephesus. And so people would go there, and they would bring get a little statue of Artemis, and that had some power from Artemis, and they would take it home, and then that would keep them, you know, more more power with the the idols and the gods, um, and people became Christians. They weren't buying the idol things, right? So this was part of what happened. Was um, in the uh, that so the, what happened in the Bible was similar to what was happening in the Reformation of trying to get points or get power by visiting uh, these little, these places, right? Okay. Um, this is the University of Basel where I studied, and it's in the library, and it's also where Eklampati is studied, in the same place. So um, he, um, af- when, he became, when he was preaching, he also um, took a job tutoring. So he took care of some people's, um, one of these rich men that had bought uh, positions for his children, the children had to be taught about theology and about how to do a liturgy, and they had to be taught some Latin and how to do the prayer, how to do the Our Father. You know, so they had to teach them these things, and that was what he did. So part of one of the jobs he did was to tutor uh, these uh, children for a while, and. Um, that was a noble son. But then he got a call to go to Switzerland, to Basel, from Erasmus. Now, Erasmus was Desiderius Erasmus, the most famous humanist of all time. Erasmus had gone to Basel because he wanted to print an official, um, definitive uh, Greek New Testament. The the reason he wanted to do this was be, uh, because um, people had, first of all, they had no Bibles because the printing press had just been invented in around 1453. So nobody had seen Bibles. Even the priests and the preachers, they never saw a Bible. Um, so people were just starting to get Bibles. But the Bibles that they, were, they had were in Latin, and a lot of the people weren't really sure about, how, about the Latin. And he said, let's look at what the original languages were. So there was a movement during the Reformation to what was called the Ad Fontes movement, back to the original, back to the fountain. Let's go back and find out what did the early fathers say? What does the Greek say? What does the Hebrew say? So there was a whole new movement to learn languages and to learn the Greek and to learn the Hebrew. So they said, but you know, we have several different Greek manuscripts. Let's just get them all together, and let's look and see. Okay, ten of them say this, one of them says that. Uh, that one must not be right. So it's got to be, you know, that this is where the period goes here. And this one has, the word has a, a letter A at the end of it. So uh, eight of them have the letter A, two of them don't, so it's, we gotta, we'll got we put in the letter A. So they had a more definitive um critical edition of the Greek New Testament from all of the manuscripts available at that time. Um, then he, he printed that up. Well, he, he wanted to print it up in Basel because Basel had the most beautiful print of all of the printing presses in Europe. Um, Basel itself had many printing presses, and it was famous for uh, its printing presses at that time. Um, so he asked Echolampadius to come because Echolampadius was a, an expert in Greek and Hebrew and the patristics. Uh, so he wanted him to come check the Greek, check any Hebrew references, look at the theology, uh, and look it over with him, and then they, they printed it up. So in 1515, he went, Echolampadius went to work with Erasmus, 
um, on the, the Greek New Testament. And um, Erasmus wrote, if they worked on in getting the original Greek, um, and at the same time, uh, Eklampadis was the um, penitential priest at the uh, cathedral. So when people would had sins, they had to, wanted to confess to God, they would come to him and he'd say, well, do this and this and this and you'll be forgiven. I mean, that was the Catholic idea at that time, um, which he learned to really hate. You know, and he realized that that was just not the way the Bible dealt with uh, forgiveness of sins at all. And that was very significant for his own theological development. Um, but uh, in terms of this Greek New Testament, it was very controversial and very important at that time. Why? Because some of the things that had been translated by Jerome into the Latin were not very well done. It was not a good translation. So, for example, uh, in the uh, Latin, it says, um, Hail Mary, full of grace. Right? When the angel comes to visit Mary, yeah? Hail Mary, full of grace. So the church, the Catholic church had looked at that and they said, wow, Mary is full of grace. Wow, she probably has more grace than she needs. Maybe we can, what we can do is the church can start giving other people her grace because she doesn't need it. And so she's full of grace. And maybe there are other people that have too much grace too. Maybe other saints. So maybe you can give the church money and we'll give you some of their grace. Right? I mean, they still do that today. And that's how you got the whole thing of indulgences. So that they were buying the favors uh, and goodness from dead saints. Which is, anyway. So... <laughs> When the Greek New Testament came out, they translated it. They showed the, what the original Greek was. It did not say, Hail Mary, full of grace. It said, Greetings, O favored one. The whole theology of indulgences and grace from dead saints was gone by that translation, by going back to the Greek. So this was a very significant uh, uh, contribution to the Reformation so that people could go and see what did God really say. Um, okay. Going back through this. <laughs> um, so, Eglampadius did receive his doctorate from the University of Basel in 1518 at the age of 36. And then immediately after that, he had the great honor of being uh, well, here's, yeah, here's his jobs. He was then appointed to um, uh, a cathedral position at an imperial city. At that time in the Holy Roman Empire, there were only 84 imperial cities. And those were particular cities with particular um, blessings from the Holy Roman Emperor and from the church, uh, so that uh, they were considered very highly acclaimed and highly honored and favored cities in many different ways. Um, Augsburg was one of the largest of those cities and one of the most prosperous. So he went straight from, from university to the highest position in the whole uh, Holy Roman Empire, the, high, the cathedral preacher of Augsburg. And in that position, not only is he a preacher, but he's expected to give lectures. He's expected to tell people what the Bible says, to interact with others, to have debates, to give opinions, to represent the city. You know, there was a lot more involved than just preaching at that point. But that was his immediate um, uh, job that he received by God's grace. Very prestigious position, very honored position. Chief pastor of all of these churches, the most wealthy city in the Empire, one of the most wealthy at that time. Um, however, three years later, he left everything and he entered a monastery in May of 1521. So the obvious question is why? Why did he leave the pastorate of such a prestigious position 
after all the work and all of the education, why? Um, and there are a lot of suppositions because he never set left any papers that explained it. Um, only God himself knows what he did to change the heart inside of that man, why he moved him from that position into a, a monastery. But we know that it was God. That was the first moving factor. There are secondary factors, which we can talk about in a moment, but I want to talk about primarily the fact that it was God that moved on his heart. Um, God act on this man and his dedication to God. This, This is the God who has created the whole universe who existed before time, who created time, Uh, the God who flung out the galaxies, and just with one word, as my husband was saying, one word, and it's there. Um, The great creator God, but uh, the one who also very intimately created man and woman in a paradise of peace, reflecting himself, loving them, having them love him. But he didn't make them robots, did he? Uh, He wanted them to love him from their hearts, and so he gave them um, a test. He forbade them to eat from the tree of life, a certain tree, and they disobeyed. They rejected God's authority over them. They broke their relationship with him. And the explicit punishment, which he promised to them, he said, if you do this, this will happen, um, was death. And, and that's what happened. That, that day, they died. They died in the sight of God and in the relationship with God. Not only did death come to them through their sin, through their rebellion against God, uh, but it also came to all their descendants, all of their children, That includes us, all of us. Now, it was impossible for the man who is not holy, he's unholy, to be with God who is holy. It's impossible. Holiness is inward as well as outward. It's not just Confucian outwardness. It's not just what you see. It's what is happening inside of your heart. God sees your thoughts. He sees your heart. Just even uh, angry Uh, thoughts in your heart that are never spoken, God sees. And you are unholy because of that. Every angry word and hateful thought, just vaunting ourselves even a, a little bit, takes away from the holiness and the honor of God and makes us unholy. So God's word, the Bible says, no one is holy. No one. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means everyone is condemned. Everyone. That's the difference between Christianity and any other religion. In all other religions, rules and laws are at the center. And you follow those laws, and that makes you good enough for heaven. But not with Christianity. There are none righteous. There are none good enough. There is no goodness that is good enough to be like God in his holiness and to be with him. How many sins does it take to go to hell? One. One. Because God is holy and we are unholy. It doesn't matter if you put in uh, a shovel full of dirt or if you just put in one grain. This is no longer holy and this is. And you can't put them together. So in Christianity, man is unholy. And he cannot be with God. No man can be with God. This is the fact that we are all condemned, all of us. There are no moral laws that make us good. There's no code of behavior that makes us good. There's nothing we can do to take away our evil. We already did evil. And there's nothing we can do to prevent ourselves from doing or thinking evil in the future as well. We are judged as imperfect Separated from holy God, our sentence of judgment is death. And God's Bible says the wages of sin is death. But God said because of his great love for us, he will provide a solution. There will be a way. 
he would send his son, Jesus Christ, who is perfect God, to earth. And he would live perfectly as a man and then change places with us. He would be our substitute and take our punishment of hell that was prescribed for us, and in exchange, we would receive his holiness. This is the great exchange. He takes our sin, we get his holiness. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Jesus died for me, for you. Instead of me, he took God's punishment as my substitute, and then he was raised from the dead. He was seen by over 500 people and sits at heaven at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge all people. What will they be judged on? Not whether they followed laws or uh, did something that looked good, like in other religions, not whether they piled up enough goodness to get to heaven. That's impossible. You can't. There's no way. They will be judged on whether they believed in God's Son, Jesus, and took part in the great exchange. Of all religions, only Christianity uniquely says that salvation from hell's punishment is God providing the substitute for us, not us trying to do things for him. God's word says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. This is not just with your mind, but with your whole heart, your whole life. And God will make you a new person and give you eternal life. Just knowing about God is not enough. Knowing every word in the Bible is not enough. Knowing the power of God and being afraid and trembling before God is not enough. Even the devil does that. If you fear God, if you tremble before him, if you know every word of the Bible by heart, you are no better than Satan. It is not a matter of knowledge. It's a matter of loving God with all of your heart and believing and trusting in him. Then you have a relationship with your father, and that is the heart of being a Christian, a relationship with God through faith in his only son, Jesus Christ. It's not just eternal life, but life now with my creator God, my loving father, starting now. Are you ready to do that today? Have you done that? I pray that by God's power you have been saved, and you have known him in this. You need to say, I need your forgiveness for my sins. I need your forgiveness for all I have done and all I will do. I knew that great exchange, and I believe in Jesus Christ. Please save me from hell. Cause me to trust in Jesus as my Lord and my Savior, both now and forever, and I will follow you with all of my heart, mind, soul, and strength. This is what happened to Echolampadius. That is why he was willing to give up everything, because he had already given up everything. He had already given up his life completely to God. So giving up a position as a high cathedral preacher in Augsburg was nothing because he'd already given his whole life to God. That meant more to him than any job or honors from men on earth. So he lived in the love of his heavenly father, who listened to him and cared for him and promised to never leave him. Um, If we look at some of the secondary causes that God used, um, we know that the political situation at that time was getting very hot. Um, Maybe it was pragmatically more important for him uh, and safe to to leave at that time. Um, He actually uh, fled and ended up fleeing from the the monastery at one point. Um, But he may have thought that he could change the church by going into a monastery and then just writing. And then everybody would read, and he could influence people by his writing or by his speaking. 
but um, he found out that he was being criticized at that point. Um, he was also impl- implicated uh, through some of the things that were being published at that time. Um, there was a, a debate between Eck and Luther, and he had um, edited and reinforced anonymously uh, a reply to Eck, criticizing Eck and being on Luther's side. Um, and the man whose paper he had edited was then condemned by the Pope along with Luther. So he knew that by implication he himself was also uh, condemned at that point too. Um, so he also uh, the Pope had said that anybody who was sympathetic to the Lutheran and Reformed ideas, um, that all of their things, all of their belongings should be confiscated. That, well, if you go into a monastery, you give up all of your worldly belongings to the monastery. So he may have been able to say, you have nothing to take from me. I've already given it all away. So just let me live here in peace and let me write and explain things from the Bible. But it just, it was not, it was not good. Um, So he was still being threatened and there was a, a local prince that was going to try to have him arrested for his beliefs. So in the next year, in 1522, actually, he fled from the monastery. Let me see, where is this little thing? Um, here you can see a map of Switzerland and where some of the things are, and you can see where Basel is. Basel's at the very top, um, towards the left, and it's where the Rhine River is, and it's right between France and Germany and Switzerland, so that it was a very prestigious and crucial place for the dissemination of publications and of reformed truths. And this is Basel, Switzerland. That's the Rhine River. And the towers are the Grossmünster, which is the uh, large cathedral in Basel. And this is a, a page from the Gutenberg Press of the, of the Bible in Latin when the uh, first printing press of Gutenberg, what he printed was the, the Bible. And this was a page of it. And this is Erasmus. Oh. And uh, this is the house Erasmus lived in, in Basel. That I just, these are pictures I took when I was there. Um, so now we're up to the point where he has, um, he's leaving the monastery. And where does he go? He flees to a castle. <coughs> and at the same time, Luther was hiding in a castle, and Capito was hiding, in, and Bucer were hiding in, a, in castles, and Hedio, another reformer. They were all hiding in castles. Why were they in castles? Because they, um, there were certain noblemen who had enough money that the emperor was afraid to bother them because he needed their money, right? So again, God used that whole thing, right? So... These men, God uh, allowed them to be protections for the the reformers at that time. So they were all hiding in castles at that uh, particular time. Um, he uh, stayed in the castle. Eklund Party stayed in the in a castle until about a year later. Uh, Luther came out, and he'd been out for one month. And during that month, he had not been harmed. And so they said, "Okay." If he's not harmed, then maybe it'll be safe for me to come out, too. Um, So he left and came out and um, went to Basel. But the question is, what what is God doing with this man? Here's this great publisher, writer, preacher, uh, academician, scholar, um, you know, a, a expert of, in all of Europe, in Hebrew and in Greek and in the patristics, and um, a very highly acclaimed scholar. And now what happens? He goes to Basel, um, and he had nothing. He had no home, no job, no reputation, he could not contact his family, no respectability from men, no credibility, 
Any benefits of his educational degrees were useless. He had no possessions. Even his books and his reading glasses he had to leave at the monastery. He left everything. Um, even his church that he loved now was rejecting him. So he, he came to, to Basel with nothing. All he had was God and God's word. But that was enough. That's enough for Moses to live on at Mount Sinai. It was enough for Elijah to cross the desert with. All they had was God and God's word. And he learned to live on that and that alone. So at this point, man could do nothing to him. There was nothing man could take from him. He had no fear. There was nothing. What would it mean anyway to to gain the whole world but lose your soul? To him, it didn't matter anymore. There was nothing to lose except his life, and he'd already given his life to God. So he came to Basel stripped, just basically a naked, poor, humble. But now, now God can use him because he is God's instrument, not his own, not his own strength. It was by God's power now. He couldn't cling to anything except God. Um, Echolampadius had lost his life for Jesus' sake. There was no safety for him anywhere outside of the arms of Jesus. God did not want his eternal son, Jesus Christ, comfortable, but crucified. And he does not want his children comfortable. He wants them crucified. So Eklampati spoke more boldly. He lost any idealism about living in a monastery and just feeding himself with the kind and sweet and peaceful ability to just read books. Um, He couldn't just take care of what his own desires were. He'd learned his limitations, but also the mercy and power of God, and he was ready to be rebuilt now by God's hand to be the humble shepherd of the sheep. So in November 1522, he returned to Basel, and he went to uh, his old publisher. This is the man who used to publish all of his wonderful books and his letters and his publications and his writings and anything that he said, people wanted to read it, and now nothing, right? So he goes to the publisher, and the publisher says, well, I have a little room. You could come stay in my house. You could be a proofreader. Those of you that are English, you know what a proofreader is, you know. Oh, you spelled that one wrong. Oh, forgot a period here. You know, he's a great scholar, and and this is what he's been reduced to at this point. He was 40 years old, and he had nothing. Um, And this was really not even a safe place necessarily either because just a year before, somebody had opposed the mass and purgatory in Basel and they'd been kicked out of the city. So he he didn't know any place really that was necessarily safe for him. Um, The population of Basel at that time was about 10,000. And um, while he was there doing the, the proofreading, The priest at a little church in town, St. Martin's, got sick, and they said, well, can you help? Because he's not doing too well. So he started helping out, preaching at the church in the evenings and doing some things um, at the the St. Martin's. And then about a month later, he began giving lectures at the university, just on his own. He went, and he would give lectures uh, about the uh, book of Isaiah, and he would give them in German uh, and refer to the Greek and the, the Hebrew. And then he would give the lecture, the same lecture, in Latin to the scholars um, on Isaiah. There were so many people that were so excited about this. Can you imagine? They have never in their lives heard the Bible in their own language. Never. Not one time. Nothing in their own language. Everything in the church was done in Latin, and they didn't speak Latin. That was what scholars spoke. He was teaching them the Bible in their own language in German. People closed down their stores just to go hear it when he, every he was 
of preaching and speaking each day. They would come from 60 miles away on horses to the city just to hear their own language of the Bible. It was the first time. It was so exciting for them. So more and more people were coming, like 400 people at a time would come and listen to him talk about the Bible and their language. They were so thrilled. Well, the university professors didn't like that, and they decided they wanted to to get rid of him, and they asked the city council to get him out of the city and to shut it down. And the, at the same time, the pope had said, anybody preaching and teaching about reformed things, you have to kick them out of, the, out of your city. And so the city council in Basel said, we're going to appoint him a professor. So they completely ignored what the other professors wanted and what the Pope wanted, and they just said, we like this guy, and he's going to be a professor according to our desire, not to anybody at the university, and he's just going to be the Bible teacher. So they were, in one sense, made Basel the first city in all of Europe to be an evangelical uh, reformed city because of that, that decision at that point. Um, now, so in, in, in six months, just six months after arriving at Basel, he is now preaching at the church, he's a professor at the university, and he's the leader of the Reformation for Basel. So God took him, because you know, it, it, God, the Bible says that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble, and that's what happened at that point. So now he's lecturing and preaching, and he's writing publications again, and he published a particular book called The The True Word of God, which took all of the patristic writings on the Lord's Supper, everything that had ever been written, and he wrote down what each of them said about the Lord's Supper, and when you read through it, you could see the Catholic idea of the mass of, of sacrificing Christ again was never there. It was never in the ancient church. There's nothing there like that. That it was what they would call an innovation. Um, so that really blew apart a lot of the things that the theology of the Catholic Church at that time. And this was one of the books then that brought to the forefront the break with the Catholic Church, particularly over communion, over the Lord's Supper. But it also brought into a well, discussion some of the controversy on um, between Luther and uh, Eklampadius' point of view, which was a Reformed point of view at that point. Um, so, uh, let's see. Then there were other things. Well, and actually, eventually, Melanchthon also, because of this book, left Luther's position. And Melanchthon was sort of the sidekick of uh, Luther, but he left Luther's position because of this book. So in 1526, um, the Spirit of God moved in Basel in a very amazing way, because you know in the the medieval church at that point, there were just a few people that were singing up front, just a little choir, maybe a few choir boys or something, and the congregation would never sing, never say anything. But that Easter... The whole congregation just broke out singing in German. It's just all of them together in German. Never done before. Well, then the city council said, no, illegal, we won't let you do that. And so the congregation said, yes, we will. And they kept doing it every Sunday. They kept singing to God in German. Um, so it was a very special gift you know, of the Holy Spirit to that whole church. And then... The city council said, yeah, okay, we'll let you do it. They changed the law. Um, In 1529, there was the Marburg Colloquy uh, over the Lord's Supper. Um, And this here's Luther when he was in the castle hiding. Um, This is where uh, Wartburg, where uh, Luther was. This is the city gate in Basel. You know, you have city gates here. That was the city gate of Basel. Um, so now he's uh, translating and publishing things, and he's at the Marburg Colloquy, and there was this big split. Um, they had uh, Luther and Eklampadius t- uh, talk together, and Melanchthon and Zwingli talk together, and Luther and Eklampadius almost came to 
perfect piece about how to understand the Lord's Supper. But you have to understand, Luther was very passionate, and Zwingli was very passionate, uh, and Eklampadius is very quiet and peaceful, and Melanchthon was very quiet and peaceful. So things would go very well when Luther and Eklampadius talked together. But then Zwingli walked back in the room and everything blew up. So it didn't, there was no peace then, and the church split at that point on the Lord's Supper. Um, Eklampadius was very, very busy at that time. Um, he uh, was writing papers, attending councils, going to disputations, debates, doing translations, uh, re- representing the the um, city at conferences, writing, editing, counseling, visiting the sick. He had a wife. He got married when he was 46, remember, and had three children, one each year. Um, and then he died very, very suddenly of bone cancer when he was 49 years old. He died a couple weeks after Zwingli, and both of these deaths then were a huge blow to the church. But both Zwingli and Eklampadius were gone. Um and his little children, he named Eusebius, which means godliness, and Irene, which is peace, and Aletheia, which is truth. And um, why is he so important? How did all of this, what does all of this have to do with Calvin? After um, he died, actually, Calvin came to Basel, and he saw how everything was set up in Basel, and he began to imitate uh, a lot of the things that he had seen in the church. Eglampadius was the first one to bring back elders. It hadn't been done for centuries, for centuries. He had elders. He wanted not city council government elders, but church elders. He had a session. He had a synod. He began general, um, uh, sort of, sort of like a general assembly type meetings. He had the city divided into four parishes, and each week a different church would have a Lord's Supper in it. Um, he um, had excommunication. Well, there was excommunication before, but it was only done by the government, and the government would excommunicate you if. One guy's wife didn't like the other guy's wife, and so they'd think up something that, you know, well, you wore your skirt too short, so, you, you know, you're, you're excommunicated. Uh, it, they just, it was very personal vengeance, that kind of thing, rather than biblical reasons. So Eklampadius wrote out a whole set of what was biblical for excommunication, and he said it should not be the city go- uh, government that's involved, because they're, they're not even Christians, some of them, but it should be the elders. And this has never happened before. There's always been just the city was in charge of everything. They decided who was in the church, who was out of the church, who gets baptized, who doesn't get baptized, what you can preach on, your subjects. That everything was controlled by the government. And he said, no, we have to separate the church and the state and these things. So that was part of his um, uh, work as well. He wrote the Basel Confession. That was the basis for the first Helvetic Confession, which then was the basis for the Westminster Confession. Um, He proposed the document on the Lord's Supper that Calvin later took up with Bullinger called the Consensus Tigurinus. He was the one who had fully developed the idea of the Lord's Supper and being taken up into the heavenlies in the Lord's Supper that people often quote Calvin as saying. That is a quote from Eclampadius that he said. If you look at Calvin's commentaries and you compare them with Eclampadius, he's quoting from Eclampadius. He just took over much of the the commentaries from Eclampadius. Um, he was a completely fully developed covenant theologian in terms of the covenant of, of redemption, uh, uh, the covenant of works, uh, the covenant uh, of grace. All of those things were completely developed, election, predestination, um, sovereignty of God. He had all of those very maturely and fully developed. And, you know, Calvin read all of those things, and it came into him as well. Um, he was m- maybe one of the greatest exegetes of Scripture that ever lived, um, and definitely the greatest patristic expert at that time, the best Hebraist and linguist of his time, 
um, everybody uh, gave him accolades, praises. Um, he was really, in many ways, the father of the Reformed theology and the earliest Reformation spokesman for covenant theology. And he was also the one then that influenced Capito and Butzer and Calvin. Um, and we could, you know, there's, I don't, I don't want to go into it unless you want to ask in a question, but his wife uh, and his children were also raised by Capito and Butzer because when he died, Capito married his wife, and when Capito died, Butzer married his wife. And so uh, she was married to four, actually four reformers. Um, so Capito and Butzer um, actually raised the children of Eclampadius, and there was a very close relationship, both theologically and in personal relationships with them. Um, so he was, in many ways, the, um, a father of what we call Reformed theology. However, um, the most important thing was that he was a born-again child of God, that he was our brother in Christ, and that the Lord has saved him as he has offered to save all of those who put their trust in him. So, uh, 하나님 구신 주복이 여러 분과 함께 하시기를 바랍니다. That's a printing press. That's Basel bread. That's the thick city hall. That's the 1523 Isaiah commentary. And this is the city hall in Basel. That's a whitewashed church because the Reformation, and this is the, where he preached at the, inner, at the uh, cathedral in Basel. There's the inside of the cathedral and the pulpit over on the left there. Um, typical kitchen at that time. Uh, children had walkers. You know, we think we're so smart. We have walkers for our children. They did too. You know. um, this is his wife and him and Capito and Butzer, her three of the four husbands. And this is where he's buried and she is also buried there in the cathedral in Switzerland. And Zwingli. Zwingli, Basel, Calvin. Done. <laughs> okay, uh, we're running a little late, but maybe we have time for a question or two. If you have one, two, you got uh, one's coming. Okay, good. Well, I have one here. So, um, this question is: What is a humanist reformed preacher? Uh, at first hearing, it sounds like an oxymoron. Yeah. Um, because we we use humanism in a different way than they did at that time. I mean, there there are two different. One is a philosophical humanist, and one is a cultural humanist. I would say. So, philosophical humanism is what we how we use the term today. But historically, when you talk about humanists, they were people that were um, changing the um, uh, uh, the culture uh, to. To make it more moral, actually, is really what the, the emphasis was at that time. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Could you say more about, this is, this is going to be our sermon tomorrow, that's why this is coming. Could you say more about a distinct reformed view of excommunication? Um, excommunication is one of the marks of the church, of the true church. Um, it is absolutely necessary in order for there to be a true church. Without it, you have a heretical church um, where you are, have people that are um, totally immoral and are not being cast out of the church, and so they're bringing blasphemy on the, on the name of Christ. So it is extremely important to have excommunication in the church. Um, excommunication in a, uh, at a is one of the hallmarks uh, of Reformed theology, actually, um, that you don't often find in other churches. So I had classmates from seminary who were having sex with their children, and when it was found, he was a pastor, 
And when it was found out, um, he was kicked out of that church, and he went down the street and became a pastor of another church because it was a Baptist church. And then, so there was no definite excommunication. In the Presbyterian church where we are, you do something like that, you're out from all the Presbyterian churches. That's You're done. You're finished um, because of the um, purity of the church and so that the name of Christ is not blasphemed among the non-believers. So excommunication is exceedingly important for the honor and glory of the name of Christ. It's It's not some sort of vengeance on an individual. It is for the glory of Christ and for his sake. Um, and, and there's only one reason you get excommunicated. There's only one sin. Only one sin for excommunication. You know what that is? Yeah? <laughs> R.C. Sproul asked me that once. <laughs> and I was in a class, and he, and he says, what's the one sin you get excommunicated? And so everybody goes, adultery, murder. No, no, no. no. So anyway, but um, the one sin that you can get, ex- the only sin you get excommunicated for is unrepentance. If you will not repent of your sin and do not turn away from it with tears and groaning, um, uh, then uh, and you, your heart is hardened in that sin, then you're excommunicated. Yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank you.